Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ali Kajowski. I am the patient outreach manager for ASGCT. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us and also a big thank you to our speakers and our co-hosts for making this possible, all of whom you'll hear from shortly. In case you're not familiar with the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, it is the primary professional membership society for people working in the field of gene and cell therapy. This includes members from universities, hospitals, government agencies, foundations, and biotech companies. A crucial priority for the society is to be a trusted source of information on the science, technology, and use of gene and cell therapy. A key part of this goal is accomplished through our patient education program, which provides accurate, reliable resources to patients, caregivers, and the public. All of our resources are free to share, they cover a variety of gene therapy topics and can be found at our, page, found at our website, patienteducation.asgct.org, also at the bottom of the screen. We are excited to be hosting our first of many Lunch and Learns, uh, giving us the opportunity to further engage uh, with you all as our audience, and I hope you find today's talk helpful. Uh, now I'll hand it over to our co-host uh, for some introduction. First off is Laura. Hello everyone, my name is Laura Burkall and I'm the Assistant Development Director at Laughing at My Nightmare. At Laughing at My Nightmare, we provide inclusivity programs to elementary schools and we also supply adaptive and medical equipment to people living with any form of muscular dystrophy. This year, we've also been focused on providing free rare disease resources to our clients. And we're also currently running a COVID-19 relief resource program for individuals with disabilities whose finances or regular care may have been impacted by the pandemic. We're thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar. And if you would like any more information on the services we provide, please feel free to contact us on our website or at the email list on the slide. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Aiken. Um, I am president of the board for the Fighting for Caden Foundation. I am also a mom to twins, Bryce and James, who were diagnosed with type one around six and a half months of age, and they will be um, six this month. So um, the Fighting for Caden Foundation is a nonprofit organization that um, our ultimate goal is just to make those with SMA, their lives better. Um, we raise awareness on the local, regional, and national levels. We provide uh, adaptive equipment that's not covered insurance, such as the lightweight wheelchairs, the micros, and the bambinos, and um, most recently the S3s. We buy tricycles, um, adaptive equipment like benches, and um, other equipment needed for therapy, and um, really so much more. We also sponsor several families to travel to the Karis May conference every year. Um, ultimately, our goal is just to improve the lives of those with SMA. So if there is a need that you have, we ask that you reach out and that you contact us. Our email and our website are listed there. Our um, form on our website will direct you um, to contacting us with any needs you have. We're excited to be here and um, please reach out with any questions you have. Thank you both. Um, so first off, we will have um, our first speaker, um, Dr. Megan Waldrop. She's going to get her slide started here um, while I do some introduction. Um, Dr. Megan Waldrop is a board certified neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology. Um, she is also board certified in neuromuscular medicine and is a faculty member of the Nationwide Children's Hospital Center for Gene Therapy. She is an assistant professor of pediatrics and neurology at the Ohio State University and an attending physician in the, neuro in the neuromuscular MDA and SMA clinics at Nationwide. She is currently principal investigator on one active gene therapy trial and is a co-investigator on six other active gene therapy trials at Nationwide. One of these includes a phase three study of Zolgensma in pre-symptomatic patients with SMA. Now I welcome Dr. Waldrop who will uh, share an overview of gene therapy and treatment options. 
I also encourage you all to utilize the Q&A feature uh, to ask any questions throughout, um, throughout any of the talks and then the, any questions will be answered at the end. Hi everyone, I apologize for this delay. Um, we are trying to get connected with Dr. Waldrop. We must have lost her in the meantime. So can you hear me now? And then I need to reshare slides. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, so I'll try resharing. Sorry about that. No problem. All right, so then I'll go back. So, so sorry about that. We did meet before to try and prevent this, and I apologize for that. Um, thanks to the committee for inviting me to speak, and we're going to do a brief overview. And so I wanted to start with the definition, um, a definition from the FDA, because I think when we, or when most people think about gene therapy, they think about gene replacement therapy. But if you look at this definition, it's a very broad definition. And you can see that all of the medications that are approved for SMA, Spinraza, Zolgensma, and Averisd, fall under the category of being a type of gene therapy. And so I think moving forward, we're gonna have to be a little more precise Instead of saying a patient got gene therapy, we're going to have to be a little more precise when we say what type of gene therapy they actually got, or if they got all of them, because there are some that have. And we're going to start today with Zolgensma. The generic name is Onisemnogene Epiparvivec, and this gets to the root of the problem. So individuals with SMA are missing the SMN1 gene, and so this is a way to give the SMN1 gene back to the patients. And it's not as simple as just taking the DNA that's missing and injecting it into the body. It would get degraded if we did that. So we need to have a package that allow it to get delivered into the cells and into the nucleus where it can then stay and make the protein that it needs. And so this is a picture showing the AAV9 vector and then a little image of the DNA that the company has put into the vector that allows us to deliver it to those individuals with SMA. But unfortunately, not everyone is eligible for Zolgensma. Um, it is only for full-term infants or infants that have reached term and then up to two years of age. And that's the approval in the United States. It's different in Europe. It's more weight-based, um, but there's a limitation of who can receive it. It's also important that the children have normal liver function if they're gonna get this medication. They shouldn't have any sort of active illness uh, around the time getting this medication. In order to be eligible, they can't have any antibodies to the AAV9 package. That would render the treatment sort of ineffective and would have a higher risk for complications. They need to have an ability to take prednisone, which helps dampen the liver response to the AAV package. 
And then there are vaccine considerations, meaning that you shouldn't have a vaccine closely around the time of gene transfer. And then how is it given? So it's a little more intense than some of the other medications. And people like to say that it's a, a one-time medication and that's true, but it's kind of a very intensive one-time medication that can take a few months before it's really complete. So you have to have your initial visit with your SMA doctors and you have to talk about all the medications that your child is potentially eligible for and then make an informed decision about which one you'd like to move forward with. And then the screening lab work needs to be done to make sure it's safe to give your child Zolgensma. And then if that all comes back and things are good to go, then prednisone or prednisolone, the liquid form needs to be started the day before gene transfer. Um, I mentioned at least the day before because here at Nationwide Children's, we've started giving it a couple days before now. And then it's given as an IV infusion over at least an hour. And some of our older and larger patients will extend the infusion time to 90 minutes. And then various centers have different observation times after. Here at Nationwide Children's, we observe the children for four hours after the infusion. And then weekly labs are needed to monitor kind of the liver response and the body's response to the medication. And usually it's weekly for at least four weeks. Sometimes it's longer. And then it depends on once we space them out, it's more when the labs have all normalized and it thinks like, seems like the body's recovering well, then we can space the labs out. We also have implemented now a weight check on day seven, just to make sure that feeding is going well, the baby is growing or the child is growing, urine output is good, just to be a little more safety monitoring, just in case. And then the children also will need to be seen monthly until they're off the prednisone or prednisolone for at least one month. The other option, and this was actually uh, approved first, is Spinrosner or Nusinersen. And this works a little bit differently. It's an antisense oligonucleotide that works to augment the backup gene or the SMN2 gene. Normally, this gene can make a little bit of the protein that SMN1 gene normally makes, but it doesn't make enough. And so the companies and researchers found ways to kind of boost the ability of the SMN2 to help individuals with SMA. And so this is just an image of what the actual drug molecule looks like. And what's the procedure for uh, nusinersen and who is eligible? So there was a wide FDA approval. It's really anyone with confirmed 5Q SMA. But then when you think about it practically, uh, the child or the adult has to be able to receive lumbar punctures. There are some alternative options, but they're a little more intensive. And then also there should be normal kidney function and normal platelet function because there's a theoretical risk of those changing on this treatment. So you will again have the initial visit with the SMA doctor and you need to have some screening, screening blood work done. And then we do it in one of three locations here and I think most centers probably do as well. So it can be done outpatient in a procedure room. If sedation is needed, then it would be done in our procedure center and then if there is um, an individual with significant scoliosis or lordosis, then it would be done with x-ray guidance and interventional radiology. And so the, the site is prepped, you know, we get the CSF, sometimes people check the opening pressure, and then the medication, which is currently the same dose for anyone, everyone that's eligible, is given over one to two minutes. And then the individual must lay flat for 30 to 60 minutes. And this is to try and prevent the headache that can happen after. And then moving forward, labs are needed periodically. And I've got an image on the side here of showing the dosing plan. So there's a loading phase, and then it goes on to a maintenance dosing every four months. So it's a lot of lumbar punctures but it's a good medicine that does provide benefit if you're ineligible for the other ones. Last one is Rizdaplam or FRISD, and it works similarly to Nusinersen, but it's a little bit different. It's a small molecule, and it works to boost the backup SMN, uh, the SMN that's produced from the backup SMN2 gene. Who's eligible? So a lot of people are eligible, but it's only approved for infants over two months of age or two months of age or older. And then the, you have to be able to take the medicine 
It goes through the gut, so it needs to be taken through the mouth or through a tube. And then I put a dosing schedule on here because it's a little bit different. Um, for Zolgensma, it's weight-based. For Nusinersen, it's the same dose for everyone. And then for Rizdiplam or Evrizd, there's a little bit of weight-based dosing. And then once you reach two years of age and 20 kilos or more, then everyone gets the same dose. And so this is the easiest one to give. You will need an initial visit with an SMA doctor to again, talk about your medication options and you know what seems best for your child or you. And then if that decision is made, then we send the prescription to the pharmacy and the drug gets shipped to the house, which is very convenient. And then the drug is taken every day, like I said before, either mouth or tube. This is just a very quick overview of some of the available clinical trials. And first is the IV gene replacement for older SMA children or adults. And this has changed a little bit from when I first heard, heard about it. So I'm really excited about that. Um, it's anyone, so they're looking to see if they can give it safely to children who are over the age of two. In Europe, it's more of a weight-based plan. So I think they're taking some data from Europe and then trying to expand the label here in the US. And they do require you to be kind of treatment naive or stop your current treatment in order to be eligible. But again, everyone, if eligible, has the potential to receive IV gene replacement therapy if they're older than the current cutoff of age two. So I think this is a nice trial to help expand the current label. And then this is another one that I think is a trial that will help expand the current label. So Rizdiplam at the moment is only available for children two months of age or older. And I know there's a lot of us that um, would love and our patients who um, really wanted gene therapy, but then weren't gene replacement therapy, but then weren't eligible either for antibodies or other reasons to give them Rizdiplam versus Nusinersen. However, we would have to make them wait two months, and sometimes we don't want to wait two months in these children. So I really like this trial because I hope it'll expand the labeling to newborns so then we can start giving those children Rizdiplam much earlier. And then there are a couple non-gene therapy options, which I'm also really excited about, and I know is not technically the topic of this Lunch and Learn, but I'm really excited because I do think there are a lot of patients out there who could use combination therapy. And I love the idea of a different mechanism of action. So you, you have two types of medicine that can work to really help these children. And so the first one is the drug from Scholar Rock, which is kind of a, it's a, an antibody that works as a myostatin inhibitor to really help the muscles get stronger. And so that is currently, there are trials that are ongoing that aren't enrolling, but there will be a phase three coming along that will start enrolling. It's not up yet, so I don't have all the details, but that's something to look out for. And then the second option, and this isn't a totally inclusive talk, but the, I'm just highlighting what I think are the exciting ones, is reldesmative, and it's been studied in ALS, and it's another one that works on the muscle. It's a fast skeletal muscle troponin activator, and they're looking to transition into trials in SMA. So I think that's another one that could be really exciting. And then I'm just gonna finish up with newborn screening. So this is from Cure SMA and any state in purple is screening, which I think is great news. What we've learned from both animal studies and just seeing our patients clinically is that earlier treatment is better. So the sooner we can get people diagnosed, the better benefit they can get from these treatments. And also the more potential both FDA approved and clinical trial options will be available to them. So giving parents and individuals a lot more choices and options to help get the best outcomes. I apologize for the delay in the beginning, but thanks everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Waldrop. That was a really wonderful overview. Um, next, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Susan Iannacone um, speaking. She is a pediatric neurologist and has been involved um, in designing and directing clinical trials in pediatric neuromuscular disease for over 30 years. She is currently 
uh, co-director of the MDA Pediatric Care Center at Children's Health. She is the associate director of UT Southwestern Wellstone Muscular Dystrophy Center, funded by the NIH. She was the primary investigator for an NIH-sponsored clinical trials group, which established for the first time reliability and validity for outcome measures in young SMA populations. She has been on a steering committee to govern the project for conducting IND-enabling toxicology studies for an AAV9 SMN gene therapy. She has also worked very closely with several patient advocacy groups and trained more than 20 pediatric neuromuscular fellows and medical students. Now, Dr. Yannacone is here to share with you some of the risks, benefits, and outcomes of these treatment options. Dr. Yannacone, I just want to make sure your mic is on. We are not able to hear you. We are able to see your screen now. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so <laughs> much for inviting me to talk today. Um, I have just a few comments uh, to uh, about about gene therapy, and I have to do it from the screen. Okay. So um, as you've all you've already heard a really nice uh, description of Zolgensma and how it works. Um, and uh, uh, one of the biggest risks, of course, is the AAV9 vector, um, which can uh, trigger a severe immune response in the liver. Um, and this is the main reason for um, uh, making, requiring children not to have antibodies to the AAV9 virus before they get treated. Um, and then uh, it is an intravenous infusion, as you heard, which is uh, not a simple deal, and the dose is weight-based. Um, and that is because the, um, as the weight of the patient goes up, that would increase um, the AAV9 uh, dose that the child receives, and as that as the dose of the virus goes up, then that increases the risk of the liver inflammation. So um, that's just a, a few comments to add to what you already heard. <clears throat> so the risks of this treatment, again, include the immune response to the virus, which can cause liver inflammation and liver failure. Uh, then there are hematologic complications that uh, affect blood clotting. Um, the uh, use of steroids is, is associated with a number of risks, and while the design of the clinical trials and the recommendations from the FDA are that the steroids be given for a limited period of time, uh, that is actually determined on the basis of uh, how the child is doing, and if the blood work continues to show evidence of liver inflammation, then the steroids will be continued. They may require an increased dose of steroids. And in some uh, cases where the, the liver um, inflammation is really severe, there may be other treatments that are required to, to bring that down. Um, uh, the, uh, you heard about the intravenous infusion and how that can uh, be somewhat complicated. Um, and we, uh, there are factors that affect the child's response to this treatment uh, besides age. We all know that uh, the age at which the child is treated is the biggest factor, uh, earlier is better and so on. But there seem to be other factors that uh, can um, affect response because we do see a number of children who receive treatment very early in life and yet seem to have an incomplete response. The cost of the drug, of course, in some cases is uh, prohibitive and does mean that uh, we often find ourselves in a negotiation with the uh, insurance company or the third 
party payer. Um, in some cases, unfortunately, that has delayed treatment. Um, so we, we cannot um, ignore the fact that the high cost of this drug um, uh, can be a, uh, an important factor in the outcome for the child. Um, and then there is concern that once a patient receives the AAV9 vector for one treatment, uh, he may not be uh, uh, able to receive any later treatment. So this is a big concern. Uh, Zolgensma is not the only um, gene replacement therapy that is being developed or proposed for SMA. Um, and uh, there is concern that the, um, that the durability of for Zolgensma could be limited. In other words, uh, there may be a point at which uh, the gene replacement stops working and theoretically the child might require a second dose or a third dose. If, uh, so having been exposed to AAV9 vector one time, then there is a huge risk uh, for an immune response with uh, re-exposure and all of the risks that go with that. Um, so uh, the outcomes that we are looking for with gene replacement therapy and SMA um, uh, start with the achievement of developmental milestones on time. So if any of you have read any of the papers from the original clinical trials for Zolgensma, this was, this was after um, survival, uh, the developmental milestones were, were the secondary outcome measure. So the goal is, is that a child who's treated early in life is going to achieve those motor milestones on time. And as, as you hear over and over earlier is better, which is a big reason why uh, newborn screening has been accepted by most of the states. Uh, if we can diagnose uh, babies before they become symptomatic, then we can look for uh, a much better outcome after treatment uh, with Zolgensma. Uh, but as I said, uh, we can't always predict that. We all see children who get Zolgensma in the first month or so of life, and yet don't seem to meet those uh, milestones on time. So we don't know what, what other factors are contributing to that. Um, most of the time, a child who's treated very early in life, uh, a child who has type 1 or uh, only two or three copies of the SMN2 gene, uh, most of the time that child uh, is going to look like a, a weak type 2. We have some patients who are very weak type 2s, and then we have other uh, treated babies who go on to uh, walk and run and climb. Um, another uh, issue that has come up that some of us wondered about before the treatment became available was whether the SMA type 1 babies who are treated with gene replacement therapy might show other neurologic deficits. So everything that we know about uh, SMA as a motor neuron disease um, told us that we shouldn't, we really shouldn't see other developmental problems, but in some cases we are. Uh, and there has been some <clears throat> written uh, in the last year or two about language delay in treated SMA1 uh, babies. So it's important to keep in mind that gene replacement therapy is not a cure. Uh, it, with the other two treatments that have been approved by the FDA can only be considered a disease modifying treatment. Uh, and uh, even if a type one baby has an extremely good response to gene replacement therapy, you're still probably looking at a child who has some motor deficits and is going to require anticipatory guidance and vigilance. So, uh, we can't emphasize enough the importance of staying with these 
SMA centers of excellence and making sure that the child is monitored uh, throughout life uh, for outcomes. Um, you heard about the possibility of uh, adding second or third uh, therapy. So again, uh, if a, just as an example, if an SMA uh, type one baby is treated early in life, and gets to age two and is perhaps sitting but not standing or standing but not walking, uh, we are, many of us are getting to the point now of considering that possibly an incomplete response. Um, and it may be associated with a plateau. We may see a child who gets to get, who achieves sitting independently by before the first year of life and then stops and doesn't seem to do anything after that. Those are the situations where we often get into a conversation with a family about adding a second drug. Um, there is no data to tell us that adding a second or a third drug will actually make a difference. Um, we have a fairly large cohort of children across the US right now who have received at least two therapies and uh, the number of children who may be getting three therapies is increasing, but there's, they're not being tracked. And so the only data that any, anybody's going to have is going to be from a single center. There's no national um, um, tracking of, of that data. There are registries, as you know, so there are a number of registries for SMA. And at some point we may be able to uh, retrieve that data, but right now uh, we don't have it. And of course, it is difficult to get insurance coverage for another drug. We have some uh, children who are on a nusinersen clinical trial now who are being allowed to add a second drug, whether, whether it's um, uh, a VRISD or not. Uh, they are going to be too old to get the Dysolgensma. Um, and then there, we always ha have a lot of discussion about what's, uh, what are the advantages of getting intrathecal versus systemic treatment. So, and this is an argument that we can make sometimes to the insurance companies that this is a child who has received um, therapy through the intrathecal injection. And that means that uh, there's, there's no systemic delivery. There's no effect on the neuromuscular junction or the skeletal muscle. <coughs> and uh, so that there is, uh, I think, fairly good rationale uh, for making that argument. And I think that's my last slide, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Yannicone. That was all really helpful information. Um, lastly, uh, we will have, I'd like to welcome uh, Brian Council. Uh, he joins us today as the father of a daughter who has SMA and is, and is also kind enough to share their story. Um, she has now received all of the approved treatments. So we hear more about the family's diagnostic and treatment journey. Welcome, Brian. <coughs> Yeah, thank you for having me. So yeah, like she said, my name is Brian Council. Uh, I have a daughter, her name is Grace. She's about three and a half years old and she has SMA type one. So uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with a lot of the things that I'm gonna say and have been through a similar journey, but just wanna go through and give firsthand experience of what things have been like for us from the moments before Grace's initial diagnosis and through what that journey looked like and through all three uh, of the current available treatments for SMA. We are one of the lucky and unique families that have been able to give our daughter all three of the gene therapies. So I uh, just kind of want to start at the beginning of what our journey looked like. So Grace is actually a fraternal twin. She has a twin sister named Charlotte. Charlotte is unaffected by SMA, but she is a carrier. So we do credit some of Grace's early diagnosis to the fact that she has a sister that is neurotypical. So uh, we saw early on just some differences between the two of them as early as you know, two months of age or so. Grace was very strong when she was born, showed no symptoms or signs of SMA or neuromuscular issues. 
But at about two and a half months old, we started to see some differentiators between our two daughters and um, started to have internal conversations amongst my wife and our family. So early on, those were things like Charlotte was able to lift her head more during tummy time. Grace was just moving her head a little bit. Charlotte was starting to bear weight through her legs. Um, we did start to notice some belly breathing and Grace was having some choking issues. She would cough while she was feeding when she was pushing closer to the three months of age. So we actually took Grace to a pediatrician when she was three months old to express our concerns. And th they did validate our concerns at the pediatrician's office and said that you know, she should be further along than she is. But we got a lot of, you know, she was born early. She's the smaller of the two twins. Every child develops at their own pace. All things that are definitely true, but in our case, those were really just things that were, we know now, justifying a bigger issue that we weren't aware of yet. So we were told to give it more time at that three-month appointment. We took Grace home, and after about 10 days, maybe two weeks, we called back and said, we need to come back in. Like there, there's something going on here right now. It, see, Grace was getting, um, I don't want to say worse, but we were noticing things more frequently, particularly the choking during feeding time. So our, our pediatrician looked Grace over again. And this time, one of the key things that she did this time that she didn't the prior time a couple weeks before is she did a reflex test on Grace. So when she did that reflex test, Grace's reflexes did not respond at all. So uh, I think that was really the first moment our pediatrician said, okay, something definitely seems off here. So we were sent to, to, for blood work. So we had blood drawn for Grace and uh, that was sent off. We, we really didn't know what to expect or what to think. We were still told, you know, she is still young. She you know, could be just developing slowly. Let's not be too concerned yet. So we ended up getting a call uh, probably two or three days later. It was actually on a Saturday evening from a, a number we didn't know. We answered it and we were told that it was our pediatrician. So we pretty much immediately knew that it was prob there was probably something wrong here. We were getting called on a weekend in the evening by our daughter's doctor. So the test that we had done was called, a, I believe it was a CPK test, which is some sort of test for uh, detecting levels of muscular breakdown, essentially. So our doctor said that the numbers were much higher than we would expect in a typical child. And from her limited knowledge, she told us basically initially she thought Grace had muscular dystrophy. Uh, her recommendation was that we see a neurologist as soon as we can. Our pediatrician had only seen SMA one time and it was in residency uh, 25 or so years ago uh, before there was any treatment. And so SMA wasn't even really on the radar at that point. Uh, that's where I, I want to just stop and say that from that first conversation we had there, this is one of the key points for us. So the other doctors that have spoke today have mentioned how time is of the essence with SMA. And I think that we all know that with SMA and other muscular conditions, time is a big factor to get to diagnosis and to get to treatment. So from that initial conversation about the blood tests don't look great, we, we need you to see a neurologist. Our pediatrician uh, was great enough that she was able to get us into a very well-known hospital to see a pediatric neurologist in three days. We were initially told there was about a three week wait and she pushed and said, here's these results. Here's what we're seeing clinically. This child needs to be seen sooner. And they were able to get us in, in, in three days. So we went, saw a neurologist in person. And within probably about two minutes, she looked at us and said, I think Grace has SMA. Our first response was, you know, what is SMA? Is that bad? Um, and of course, from there, she went into the details about what SMA is, what type she thinks Grace has, and that, yes, it, it is obviously not a good thing. She was able to diagnose Grace so quickly because of her tongue fasciculation, so the vibrating of the tongue that's atypical for most children. So just by seeing that, among the other things that she saw while we were there, she was able to pretty confidently say, this is SMA, we need to get blood work to confirm, but I'm fairly confident. Uh, this is also something that other parents may have experienced in their journey for diagnosis through whatever condition their child might have. But when we had this initial conversation with the doctor, it was a, it's kind of a, a mixed experience. So we were told about SMA and what that means and historically what that looks like. But our, do our, daughter, our doctor also said the words to us that she said, why are you upset? This is a great time for somebody to be diagnosed with SMA. 
and that that still sticks with us very vividly. Uh, I don't I don't think today, even with the technologies and treatments that are available, even with newborn screening, that I would ever say it's a good time to be diagnosed with SMA. I get what she was saying from a treatment perspective, but from a, a family, especially with a child that is, is symptomatic, it was tough for us to hear. This is a good time to be diagnosed with SMA. That doctor, even though she was head of neurology at a large uh, hospital, a top you know, 15, 20 hospital in the US for patients seen with SMA, still didn't seem at that point to have a great grasp on what the treatments looked like. So um, I guess I should say this. So this was back in 2018 when Grace was diagnosed. She was diagnosed at that doctor's office just before she was four months old. So it was relatively quick compared to uh, a lot of symptomatic children. Uh, our, what we were given is that with the treatments that are available, Grace can li live a typical life uh, from a developmental standpoint, that she can still develop normally, if you will, walking. We, we left that meeting being told that Grace may not be able to play sports when she's older, but should be able to hit other developmental milestones. <clears throat> we know now with you know, what we've learned and through research that that's just not realistic for a child that's not diagnosed on the newborn screening. We know that that's probably not what Grace's life is going to look like, but um, yeah, just kind of wanted to mention that that was our our initial diagnosis situation. So then uh, we we were able to walk away from that meeting with next steps in place was so we were sent for blood work to confirm her diagnosis. We were told let's schedule a meeting to come back once you have the diagnosis and we'll talk about what next steps are. So we set an appointment for just over a month out from the appointment where she was diagnosed in clinic. That's another thing now we know that, that that's, that's just not really acceptable. We should not have been waiting a month to be seen again. So luckily, we went home from that appointment, did our own research, found out that time is so much of the essence that we started advocating for ourselves, calling around other hospitals, other doctors to talk about what our options were. We were lucky enough to find a hospital that was it was almost seven uh, hours from where we were located via car, but they were able to see Grace within a couple of days and said that once her diagnosis came back, they could have her scheduled for treatment with Spinraza within just a couple of days. Spinraza was the only available treatment at that time that was FDA approved, although others were in trial. But so that, that office was that told us they could basically have her set up to get treatment within a day or two of her blood work coming back. That hospital also called the lab where Grace's blood work was and had it rushed. So we got results from her genetic testing in I think it was four or five days versus the three weeks we were originally told that it would take. So my point there and the thing that I wanna emphasize is being an advocate for yourself and uh, you know, there's brilliant doctors in the world and on this call with us as well, but nobody can know everything. So I would say as a parent, always push and, you know, try to figure out what you can and make sure that you're making the, the best decision for your child. We very much so credit how well Grace is doing to the fact that we got in very early to a neurologist, got diagnosed quickly, and then got treatment. Grace ended up getting treatment within it was about uh, eight or nine days from her initial clinical diagnosis. So it was very, very quick. She was dosed with Spinraza at four months old. So from there, um, I'll, I'll kind of wrap things up quickly from there and talk about it. just a couple other quick points. So Grace did get Spinraza when she was four months old, continued on Spinraza until she was um, about 14 months old. But in between there, she actually was able to receive Zolgensma at 11 months old. So Grace receives Zolgensma through the early access or managed access program because everyone thought that it was going to be a weight-based dosing like it is in Europe, not that it was going to be everyone two years and under. So Grace was pushing the limit that we thought was going to be for the weight. So we were all lucky enough and fortunate enough to have her dose with Zolgensma before she was, she was one years old. So she was just under 11 months old. Grace had started sitting independently shortly after that, uh, within just a couple of weeks. Obviously, that's not 100% credited to Zolgensma. It's the combination. She was still on Spinraza. We chose to continue Spinraza through, uh, through that time period, even after Zolgensma. We made that decision, and we were lucky enough, again, to because Zolgensma was achieved through the managed access program, our insurance didn't pay for it, so they were willing to continue on Spinraza for us.
So Grace continued, Spinraza continued to get stronger, continued to be healthier until uh, we were able to get again into the early access program for Everest D. So we discontinued Spinraza at that point, uh, just because in our opinion, Spinraza was uh, a rough dosing. Those days were, were tough for Grace and on our family. So we chose to go with Everest D. And Grace continues on Everest D today. And we've, we've seen huge gains just overall. Um, the things that I would say that we credit towards the Ebrisdi versus potentially Spinraz or even Zolgensma is energy levels, her swallowing, her breathing, her volume, when she speaks, yells, all those things have seemed to really take off with Ebrisdi versus other treatments. And that is totally anecdotal to our scenario and could be different from everyone. But I'm happy to say now, I mentioned Grace is three and a half months old or three and a half years old. And with all three treatments, Grace sits completely independently and very safely. We will sit her down anywhere and she sits very firmly. She is starting to stand and take steps independently and with parallel bars. She does wear uh, AFOs, HKFOs, depending on what the scenario is that allow her to stand and bear weight longer. Um, she eats completely orally. We don't restrict hardly any foods for her to eat. She does very well, limited choking or any issues there, passes swallow studies with flying colors, is not on any BiPAP or uh, breathing treatments of any kind. And she has done plenty of sleep studies to confirm that that's not necessary for her. So among all the things, just uh, I'll wrap up here and say, some of the key points for us to get to this spot where we're at and how fortunate with the Grace's health that we are is we caught signs early. We got an initial appointment with a neurologist early as well. We advocated for ourselves uh, among help from some great doctors along the way. We were able to shorten the time between diagnosis and to treatment. We were able to do that dual or even in our case, tri therapy, uh, gene therapy treatment Everest, Spinraza, and Zolgensma. And then we also do put Grace through very, um, know, very strenuous therapies as well. She does therapy at least four, four days a week. She does physical therapy, aquatic therapy, occupational therapy, and hippotherapy, where she does horses and physical therapy combination. So all of those things, uh, it's just kind of part of our journey, got us to where we're at today, and some of the things that we credit to uh, Grace's health. So thanks for listening to all that, everyone. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, your story is just incredible and the strength of your family is, is amazing. Um, glad to hear that Grace is doing better as well at this point. Um, so I would like to welcome Dr. Yannikone and Dr. Waldrop to also join um, for the Q&A portion. Um, anyone can feel free to submit questions still. Otherwise, I will just start off here um, for any of you to answer. So one question is, I'm worried one treatment type won't be enough for my child. Uh, what is the outlook for dual or combination treatments? How do these treatment options impact one another? I guess I can take a stab at that. Um, we know that there are a lot of patients out there still, unfortunately, because newborn screening hasn't been implemented everywhere and hasn't been going for a long time now, that there are patients who are symptomatic when they are first treated. And the, I think the general consensus in the community is that those are the ones that would benefit or could benefit from dual therapy. I think what's hard for us is as physicians, we always want to do evidence-based treatments that we know are going to be the safest and most efficacious for our patients. And it's hard in the field now because we don't have any head-to-head -head comparisons and we don't have any great studies where we can see if these two are together, what is the safety and what's the outcome? And if these two are, what are the safety and what's the outcome? But um, we have some, I think each of us in the large centers has some general idea of which patients maybe seem to do a little better with Spinraza and which patients maybe seem to do a little better with Everisdi. 
Um, and we're biased here at Nationwide Children's. I think um, we tend our preference is gene therapy for everyone. And then we consider add-ons after that. Of course, we know that some people aren't eligible and we would ha then have to pick Nusinersen or um, Ristaplam. Um, so I think it's a hard decision and it's, you have to educate the families on what you know from both what's been published and what you've seen in your clinic and then have a good informed discussion about what the risks and or benefits may be. And then, you know, will insurance play a role? And it shouldn't, but it does sometimes. And, you know, if that, if that happens, you know, what would our backup plan be? Or how are we gonna monitor your child to assess for efficacy? And when will we decide maybe to switch or change our plan? And that's a very vague answer, but I don't know if Dr. Anna Cohn wants to jump in as well. I, I agree with you completely. It's, um, it's a case by case um, judgment right now. A lot of, um, a lot of discussion with the family. Um, and then once a decision is made uh, to add a therapy, then we go into the discussions with the insurance company, which is a whole other thing. Um, and it is unfortunate that we don't have any data on which to make these decisions, um, but that's, that's what we have right now. Um, thank you. Uh, our next question is actually for Brian. Um, first, they said, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, and then they also asked, what kind of ongoing support would have made this journey easier, uh, such as caregiver peer, peer groups, uh, logistical support, um, or when you took Grace to treatments or follow-ups? Yeah, that, that's, that's always a tough, a tough one. And I've been asked that multiple times just through our entire journey, what would have been some extra support that we could have used? Um, we, we found the, the online parent and caregiver groups extremely supportive as well, but you know, there is some disorganization there, so there, it's nothing formal. It's just a group of us going and sharing thoughts and ideas. So certainly there is some things that could be built on there to expand on support, be able to talk about specific scenarios from diagnosis through right now. We feel like we're at a pretty level spot where our day-to-day -day is pretty normal, if you will, but... There's still some things that, that we need that we could probably get in a more formal environment than just everyone's grouped opinions on Facebook, for example. Um, and then one thing that I always share with that kind of question is it's very difficult for families like ours and many others, including ones on this call, to get uh, like the respite type of support that families often need. So there's very few people only probably two, maybe three that we trust to leave our daughter with just because of even as healthy as she is, her care is still unique. She still uses a wheelchair. There are certain foods we don't allow her to have. So there's only a handful of people we'll leave her with. We don't get time away very often. We love being with her, but uh, like date nights, things like that are very uncommon for us. So that's a gap I still think in the, the care and support in the SMA community that is out there. Thank you, Brian. Um, another question is, um, as we see clinical trials opening for older types or weights, uh, would you advise taking a chance on this? Well, the answer could be yes, or the answer could be no. Um, I think it depends on the current level of function that the child or individual has, um, how much improvement or benefit was seen from the current treatment regimen. Um, I think how much time they're gonna want the child to be in the washout period or you know, taken off the other medication and how, um, how safe or unsafe that might be based on current level of function. And then also, I mean, you have to think about, you do need to have this washout period, but then you also need to meet all of these 
lab and safety and functional outcome measures to be eligible. So really thinking about the timing of that too. And I don't know the exact design for all of the studies, but I would want to really have a clear idea of what that would look like and what the timeline would be. And then how quickly, if it turns out the child is not eligible, um, treatment could be restarted. I always advise families to stay as up to date as possible on what uh, with what's going on with clinical trials. Um, most of the families that are connected online with organizations such as this one uh, stay pretty um, informed about clinical trials. And then we have national meetings such as the QSMA meeting for families every year that uh, works hard to bring families up to date with research. Um, and then I always give uh, families the clinicaltrials.gov uh, URL so that they can look at that periodically. And then I ask them to bring their questions to me. An another piece of advice would be if, if you find a clinical trial that you think your child might be eligible for and um, you're interested in it, you can actually contact them directly. So usually there'll be uh, a contact number for the research coordinator for that particular trial listed in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and so you can contact them directly to see, you know, what, what are the risks and possible benefits for your child. Um, or you can ask your neurologist to uh, refer you to that research coordinator. All right, and I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, if I have a newborn who is, I think we've kind of touched on this throughout um, the talks today, but uh, just in case, if I have a newborn who is recently diagnosed, how do I decide between Spinraza and Zolgensma? Um, and how long do I have to decide? Well, so I think it's important to have an exam by an SMA doctor. There are some very subtle findings that can be picked up even on a week old baby, very, very subtle, but as we've been examining them more and more off newborn screen, I think um, we're starting to get an idea of you know who might be a two copy baby and who might be a three, and then a predicted type one or a predicted type two. So then the exam with your doctor um, definitely getting the confirmatory testing and the SMN2 copy number can help you and your doctor decide how much time you have to decide. Um, we usually concurrently do the labs, if the family is interested, the labs for Zolgensma and the labs for Spinraza, just to kind of keep things as streamlined and moving as quickly as possible. And we really get both um, authorizations started. Like we really try and do everything as quickly and have both options ready to go for whichever one happens. Um, I would say in certain instances, like maybe a four copy baby. Um, and if you wanted to wait for Ristoplam or FRISD, that's something that I think we would all have a, a discussion with, with the family. Um, so there is a little bit, I think, of probably we always try and step back and do a very unbiased description of each medication for the family, all the data, what the data shows, and then take into account the laboratory results and which can go where. But from what I've seen, usually families are leaning towards one treatment over the other at the start. Um, and we certainly are willing to answer any and all questions and try and you know, we always usually get asked, so which one do you think is better? And so that's where a little bit of the provider bias comes in. But I like to keep all, option, all options open as long as possible. Yeah, I, I agree completely with that. We pretty much do the same thing here. All right, everyone. Well, we are at the hour. I don't see any further questions. Um, 
So just wanted to let you, first of all, thank you all for presenting and, and thank you to those who attended as well. Um, we'll be posting this recorded session on our website early next week um, and sending it out in an email. Um, you'll get a link to it. So if you thought this information was useful, please feel free to share it. Um, and then we will also be offering more of these lunch and learn series on various gene therapy topics um, starting in February of 2022. Uh, so we have a series planned out to offer. We'd love for any of you to join us in those. Um, and then also you'll see on your way out as you leave the event, there is a quick five question survey. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, that would be really great to get your feedback. Um, so thanks again, and we hope you all have a wonderful weekend.